All right, hello and welcome today to a new episode here on the Wars Rebellion podcast for H Soul War. We are finally in the new studio. I'm very happy that I finally have my books behind me and can actually do this more in a proper way <laughs> instead of sitting in a chair in the bedroom as it has been in a few of the past episodes. So we're moving up in the world. And of all things, for this first episode, we're not talking about the Civil War period. We're actually talking about the early Republic. <laughs> Um, a very different subject matter for all of us here on the podcast, but I'm very glad that we're doing it and we're going west. Like what you usually don't think about when it comes to the early Republic, the West and the Mississippi River. So today we are going to talk with Susan Gons Gons Stearns. She is a now associate professor, as I assume, at Ole Miss since she just got tenure, which usually goes with a promotion. Um, Oxford, Mississippi. Um, I'm pretty sure University of Georgia and Alabama will love to come to town this year. And that said, she got her PhD from the University of Chicago in 2011. And the book we are going to talk about today was published with University of Virginia Press and is Empire of Commerce, the closing of the Mississippi and the opening of Atlantic trade came out in May of this year, 2024. So Susan, to, to start, I always like to ask my, my interviewees, how how did this book come about? How did you get interested in the Mississippi River trade and like this like global politics that is associated with this time period? Well, thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so this book grew out of my dissertation. Um, and so the dissertation came about because uh, in one of my graduate classes, we had this assignment one day, which was to go like read a periodical, essentially, mm -hmm. find something that was published multiple times, um, you know, so like weekly or monthly or, or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, read about a year of it, or at least six issues of it, essentially, and say something about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I decided that I would read uh, the first newspaper that was published west of the Appalachian Mountains. Um, and so the first newspaper that was published west of the Appalachians is the Kentucky Gazette. It begins publication in 1788. And um, it was published in uh, Lexington, Kentucky. Mm. And um, I chose it for a couple of reasons. One was I was interested in Western expansion. Um, so that was part of what led me to look at Kentucky. Um, and the second reason was that the library at the University of Chicago had a photostatic copy that I could take home with me. So, um, Ooh. yeah. So, uh, you know, I didn't have to read it digitally, um, nor did I have to go to special collections to read it. And that of course, you know, that, that was me sold. Um, so I brought it home and um, I started reading and the very first paragraph of the very first issue of the Kentucky Gazette is talking about like what will happen without access to the Mississippi. And it's talking about how badly they need to reopen the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And so here I am looking at it and being like, I had no idea what they're talking about. I had no idea that the Mississippi was ever closed. Um, you know, I'd taken numerous courses in American revolutionary history, uh, you know, and in the American founding, but I had never seen this issue really um, come up or, or get too much emphasis um, right. in my reading. So I was immediately like, all right, well, what is that? And uh, I started looking into it and um the result was this project. Um, it's kind of funny though, because I definitely, I started off with a Kentucky project and ended up doing my research in Spain, um, which is There's sort worse of places to go. Absolutely. 
Oh, that's crazy. And uh, so, ooh, that's so. Do you speak Spanish that you were able to kind of do like source work in Spain, or was it like were they writing in French? What what do I have to think about here? So, um, the a lot of the research, some of it was in Spanish. Um, I don't well. At one point in time, at some point in the far distant past, I was fluent in Spanish. Um, that 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 time has passed for sure. Um, now I actually feel pretty comfortable reading Spanish, uh, but but less so speaking. And actually, my Spanish um, you know is very much shaped by what I read. So I know a lot of 18th century words for like <laughs> boat and uh, different kinds of fabric because those are things yeah. that. You know in the past people are writing about all the time uh, but like modern words like like password um you know that that leaves me sort of a uh, a little bit hanging and I, I sort of speak spanish like i'm a shakespearean actor <laughs> essentially like um it's yeah. like you know um look upon yonder eminence kind of thing uh so i get a lot of yeah. laughs No, well, at, at least you can communicate. I mean, like, I had a job offer in Barcelona, and when they said everyone here speaks Catalan, they refuse to speak Spanish. I was like, oh god, now I have to learn two languages for the price of one job. Yikes! <laughs> I don't want to learn. I don't want to learn Catalan and Spanish. I would just like <laughs> one would be sufficient. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's it is crazy. Yeah, so that that is fascinating to kind of just stumble on. on these newspaper articles and from there the story sort of develops mm -hmm. the the other parts though so you, you we have spain we have kentucky but one of the other big factors that you bring into the conversation with your book is the native american voices and i was especially kind of interested in like how how did you get to kind of the chickasaw how did their their voice enter the narrative how were you able to kind of Like what sources were you able to locate for them? So, um, the issue of how to incorporate uh, indigenous voices into the story has been one that I really struggled with for, um, you know, this book took me forever. Uh, I started writing my, dissert my dissertation in 2008. This was published this year. So it's been a very, very, very long time. Um, and it's been an issue that I've struggled with uh, repeatedly. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why I constantly was was trying to figure out how to include indigenous voices um, is that really very much Euro-Americans are operating um, in a world that is fully an indigenous world in a world mm -hmm. in which they're interacting with indigenous peoples daily, but that they're imagining a world really that is largely without indigenous people. And so when they're establishing their their politics or when they're thinking about what the possibilities for trade are, mm -hmm. um, they're often doing it sort of purposefully um, omitting indigenous oh. peoples and indigenous voices. Yeah. And so you kind of end up with um, sort of a, a political ideology, essentially, of um, the West and of oh. like West, the West's relationship to the rest of the Republic that is actually um, very separate from oh. the West's thinking about indigenous peoples. Um, and so that was a, a that was very interesting and a, sort of a big part of, of why I had a, 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 it took me a long time to figure out um, the best ways of incorporating indigenous peoples without oh. making it into a truly monstrous uh, <laughs> manuscript, you know, and by monstrous right. in this case, I mean, you know, enormous, right? Um, too long to That's be read, right. for sure. Um, I landed on the Chickasaw for uh, several different reasons. Um, the main reason has to do with geography. So one of the big things I think that we often forget about in our modern day world is the ways in which um, geography Uh, the landscape, the climate, mm -hmm. the, um, you know, just where are rivers, where are roads, where are uh, mountains, et cetera, um, how all of that affected life in, uh, you know, historical time periods in the 18th century in this case. But, um, you know, I can obviously 
I can drive anywhere I want, essentially. And I don't have to worry that there's going to be a giant swamp in the way. You know, sometimes I might have to drive to a bridge to get over a river or something like right. that. You know, like that can still be an issue. But mm -hmm. in general, you know, right. um, the modern infrastructure has tamed a lot of these issues of mm -hmm. like, oh, these mountains are too big to get over, et cetera. Um, but we take the landscape seriously and we think about how, um, how it helped shape life. Um, mm -hmm. One of the big things that emerges um, pretty quickly is that in the 18th century, if you wanted to get anywhere quickly, you needed to go by water. Mm -hmm. um, overland travel is incredibly difficult and hard to do. Um, and so in the West, uh, and by this, I mean the West, West of the Appalachian Mountains, um, which in the early Republic is the West. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, the major bodies of water that dominate the region are the Ohio River and the Mississippi River. Um, and then there are other, obviously other smaller rivers. Uh, many of them feed into those two. Um, but those two rivers are the ways in which people know they can get around mm -hmm. um, for most of the year, at least yeah. um, most of the time. And so... Um, this brought me to the Chickasaw, and, and I'm getting there uh, in an interesting way. But um, there are a few sites along the Mississippi River. If you've ever driven along the Mississippi River uh, and you're on the, the western side of the river, um, so like in mm -hmm. Arkansas, Arkansas, for instance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it is unbelievably flat. And it's if you the delta. look at the landscape, <laughs> you can tell that at some point this was flooded. You mm -hmm. know, this yeah. has it has been underwater for much of history. Um, you know, and if you read uh, Steve Aaron's book, American Bottom, or if you read um, Christopher Morris's book, um, The Big Muddy, mm -hmm. they both talk about sort of this long geological history of uh, the Mississippi River Basin. Um, and so what that means, though, is that there are a few points along the river that are, are high highlands, right? So strategic mm -hmm. points where um, watercraft coming down the river are going to have to go past these points and that they're going to have to, um, but that they offer people who control those points along the river, the opportunity to sort of control traffic along the river. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the points is yeah. the falls of the Ohio, which is where now Louisville is. Um, you know, it's the, so boats had to either portage around there or they had to wait until the water got high enough to go over that, that point. Um, but the other two points that really, uh, were really significant are um, what's now um, one of the regions is called Chickasaw Bluffs. Um, mm -hmm. It's now where the city of Memphis is located, um, but it's a one of the few places along the Mississippi River where um, somebody would be elevated enough, up high enough, essentially, to see people coming from miles around. Oh, yeah. Um, so if you can control that river, that choke point, essentially, um, then you can control uh, who's able to access the river. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Chickasaw are the ones who control that region. Um, and so in the 18th century, uh, the Chickasaw are a formidable but small group of people. Um, so their population numbers are, are really small for their sort of outsized um, influence that they play over the region. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's largely because they control this point at Chickasaw Bluffs, um, where they can decide essentially who goes down the river and who is not going to be allowed to go down the river. Right. Um, they and never, they don't have know, like complete control. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, as you were talking, I kind of was like, when you think about it, right, that's, that's the hardest part to think about when you think of the Mississippi River today, because it's so straightened out. It's so like the hand of man adjusting the rivers everywhere like the um, um, civil war historian right you, i think of vicksburg and like that big bend around the city that just is like it's a dead end these days but like it wasn't at the time and just yeah the, the traveling down this river it's just it's so challenging and uh, well and challenging downriver um is actually easy yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, like, upriver is even worse. Upriver is terrible. Um, reading about how people would get upriver, I mean, 
they um, the most common way of going upriver with a cargo with a load of cargo um, is to pull up mm. the river. And so, you know, a group of uh, like 20 men uh, would stand on either side of a, a boat, essentially, mm. with a pole on their sh- on their shoulder. And they'd start at one end of the boat and then they just walk 30 feet down yeah, and you go with in. their pole, like their shoulders stuck to the bottom of the of the Mississippi, essentially. And, okay. and they can move at about, you know, at, at times as like eight miles a day. Mm. Um so um and they're walking really if you think about it they're walking up the mississippi multiple times in order to pull that boat essentially uh the whole way so it's huge difficult uh challenging labor so right which is like i i remember some of the early i think it's mentioned in your book too of like how you just when you get down river to new orleans you just sell the boat and give it up and then take another boat around to get back up into the Ohio River Valley to get the next cargo and new boat because it just it wasn't economical to go up river yet. Absolutely. Yeah. Small boats, um, you know, small boats can do it. Uh canoes can do it. There's yeah. all these um like eddies and currents along the river uh that make it possible for like a small boat to right. navigate it much more easily. But for if you want to bring cargo, you know, yeah. um going up river is is a very big challenge. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, 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 certainly, right? I mean, yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about a little bit with regard to the the river sort of as this like it, it's a transportation artery, right? But on the other hand, like you kind of mentioned with Spain already, it is also this I, I, when I send you the, the the kind of talking points, I kind of was almost saying like it, it's almost a a toy, right? It's like this geopolitical toy that Spain and France and Britain and the United States play around each other of like, ooh, I'm going to get it this time. You get it next week. And, oh, we're not going to give it to the little United States and we're going to close the river off or something. Like it's, it, 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 it is more than just the river. That's what, sort of what I want to say with that, right? It's like, it's, it's this very challenging piece of politics absolutely um and you're right it so it changes hands all these different times but um but what's ironic about that is that very often when it's changing hands the europeans who are changing like exchanging it have absolutely no control over it um they are you know the you know people in versailles can draw on a map whatever they want essentially (laughs) Um, But that's not going to mean it's going to be enforced in Mm -hmm. St. Louis, like, for instance. Um, So uh, what happened, that's actually really where the Chickasaw come into the story more frequently, because these Europeans are saying, like, we own the river, we own the river. And the Chickasaw are kind of sitting there being like, um, folks, we own the river. We got this. Um, You know, I mean, the river is, of course, used by all indigenous peoples of all nations, um, by Europeans of all nations. But in terms of actually being able to control it, oh. um, you know, the, the Chickasaw really do have uh, for a big chunk of the period under con- you know, discussion here, um, the 18th century up until about uh, 1800, oh. a little earlier, 1895 or so, um, where the Chickasaw really do have the strongest you know, claim oh. on being able to control this river. Yeah. Um, so the but the thing about the mississippi that is uh really interesting and it's very much how i came to this really in a big way is that i was writing this book or started working on this this dissertation um in 2008 like at the height of the the housing crisis Mm -hmm. um and the the market crash and housing prices and one of the big things that that really led me to think about is that um is that land always has multiple values right Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and one of the biggest ways that land gains value, it isn't, well, excuse me. So people think about land in lots of different ways. Uh, there's land that you might live on. There's land that you're from, there's land mm-hmm. that you want to buy and sell, right. right. That you want to speculate in. Um, and that all those lands gain value through different means and mechanisms mm-hmm. essentially. Right. So, you know, like if we take 
the example of Thomas Jefferson, for instance, he lives at Monticello. And Monticello is his like home place. He's not selling it, essentially. But he has this vision of a West that is full of places mm -hmm. that he can buy and sell without any kind of emotional investment, essentially. Mm -hmm. And this made me think a lot about how, like what does end up giving a home or land value, essentially. Mm -hmm. Man. Um, and part of that is essentially about, um, you know, like, what can you do with the land? And so in the 18th century, uh, when Europeans looked at land, um, a big part of what they, they saw in it would be, is essentially future farms, right? Like mm -hmm. places right. that somebody else might turn into their version of Monticello, yeah. you know, their, their home place, essentially. Um, but that what would give the land ultimately its value is both people's desire to um you know to create a home in a new place but also the ability of whatever is produced on that land to reach markets and so essentially when um when they're thinking in the 18th century about um the west one of their unspoken statements often is, it's often unspoken, sometimes it's spoken, um, is the idea that the people who live on those lands are going to be able to um, sell whatever it is that they're making, mm -hmm. essentially. And the Mississippi River is really central to that um, because if uh, Western settlement settlers don't have access to the Mississippi, then they're not going to be able to sell what their land produces. Mm -hmm. And if they can't sell what their land produces, then they're not, the value of the land is never going to go up very much. And then they make their voices heard and say, you need to do something to allow me to you know, get my stuff out. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but what's ironic really is that a lot of the arguments about reopening the river uh, occur years if not decades before people actually have right. stuff right. to sell you know right. they're they're imagining like i said a, yeah. a future where they're going to be selling stuff down the mississippi and they're like one day we'll sell you know our wheat to china and yeah yeah, yeah no but that's when you think of it that has often been how the united states got involved in various enterprises right like i Diplomatic historic courses always talk about late 19th century, that myth of the great China market and how like, oh, it's this endless billion people that want all these goods we have to offer and it never really materialized actually like opposites these days. Absolutely. Um, and in that way, like these guys are like, oh, there's this great opportunity, which well, in their case actually did materialize on some level. So when you were talking, I also was thinking about like how there's sort of like this desire of like, right, we, we want this land to open up and we want to eventually grow commodities like cotton here that we then can get out into, into the world. But we're also still in a period where the United States is like in, in, in the early parts of the book, not existing, barely coming about, kind of still formulating how it's going to look, articles to constitution period. And there's sort of like, I, I love that story of Andrew Jackson that you have in there of like this, the malleability of your personality, of your your loyalty, right? Like, hmm, I can say I'm, I, I will be loyal to Spain and I can get land in, in what will eventually become Southern Mississippi or Louisiana. I will say that, who cares? <laughs> I just want the land, right? Well, and I think, I think that's something that, um, very much a product of the 19th century, we have this idea of manifest destiny, right? The idea mm -hmm. that uh, there's almost like a, a United States that spreads westward. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually almost never really accurate. Um, westward expansion doesn't occur as like like a, a blob of slime slowly mm -hmm. oozing out and spreading across the landscape, right? Um, it much more frequently occurs where, uh, you know, somebody creates an outpost somewhere very far away and mm -hmm. then they connect to the outposts essentially yeah, yeah. um you know like That's california for instance, think about it. part of the united states mm -hmm. you know, way before colorado to, like before mm -hmm. you know the stuff in between does um because very much um 
expansion doesn't occur from a center expanding outwards into a mm. periphery. Instead, expansion usually occurs from like a, a wheel and spokes, essentially, mm -hmm. like a, a center and spokes of a wheel um, mm. emerging. And so um, one of the things I think when it comes to political ideology and political identity is um, that people are in general um, often driven by, I mean, I think, I think this is the case. People are often driven by their political and by their economic interests, essentially. Um, so they make choices often based on their economic interest as opposed to on ideological ideals, mm -hmm. you know, essentially. Right. So um, sort of that, Yes, the American Revolution is about freedom, but the American Revolution is also about who's going to collect your taxes. Like they're, um, you know, they're, mm -hmm. uh, the people are, and always have been, pretty pragmatic in mm -hmm. their operation, essentially, and in, in, in deciding who they're going to follow and what actions they're going to take. And so I think with, um, in the 18th century, we have to really imagine a world in which there is no United States. There's no Americanness. Andrew Jackson, uh, when he, uh, at the, so 1789, Andrew Jackson um, goes to Spanish Natchez and he swears allegiance to the crown of Spain. And, um, you know, but the thing is like, we have this image of Andrew Jackson as being like the guy in the $20 bill, you know, the seventh right. president of the United States, um, you know, Defender of New Orleans, right? That's, right, that's Defender of New Orleans, absolutely. It would be hard to point to someone who like more embodies 19th century America than yeah. Andrew Jackson or certainly parts of 19th century America. Um, but in 1789, when he's doing this, you know, uh, George Washington has been the president of the United States for like two and a half weeks. Um, you know, and... Actually, there's no way Andrew Johnson knows, excuse me, Andrew Jackson, sorry. Uh, I don't know what Johnson's up to, but Andrew Jackson. <laughs> um, <aboard> yet. <laughs> I don't think so, yeah. Uh, but Andrew Jackson can't even know that. Um, in the mm -hmm. 18th century, uh, in this right. time period, it takes about, um, you know, but it takes about 65 days to get from New York City to London. Yeah. Okay. And it takes about 95 days to get from Richmond to Lexington, Kentucky. Nine so days. three months it, it, it can depending on how you're going um, oh, oh boy. essentially um you can do it faster but don't bring your children or anything um <laughs> but uh okay yeah <laughs> that's probably good advice for moving fast anyway um at all yeah, times yeah, yeah, but yeah. um and three months is a long time eight weeks but essentially you know it's uh the it takes forever to get right. word out west um, right. and for word to get back. And so, you know, Andrew Jackson is out there and he's swearing allegiance to the crown of Spain. He, you know, actually doesn't right. know what's happening yeah. back in New York. Moreover, um, in the, 1789, Andrew Jackson's a 22 year old, like lawyer, just like trying to figure out what he can do to make some money. Yeah. Um, you know, and he's, looking out for his own Andrew best Jackson. yeah yeah exactly um, okay. you know and um heck you know so when andrew jackson moves to the west he moves as the attorney general for sort of north carolina's western most district oh. and the fact that they gave the attorney generalship of this western most district to a 22 year old yeah. really tells you a lot about how many people want to move to this region at that time um yeah, choices are limited yeah exactly uh you know it's a um, the west the early western settlement um especially in like what's now tennessee mm -hmm. is incredibly violent um yeah. you know i think like the first three attorney generals of kentucky all died in a uh, war with indigenous peoples um yes. like so mm -hmm. for people who are out who are moving out to this region, they're, they're moving out there and they're looking for any entity that can really secure for them three things. Um, one is safety. Mm -hmm. uh, two is land. And they want somebody who's going to give them a clear title to land that they can then, you know, defend and, you know, uh, 
leave to their children, sell, Mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, They're looking for that. And then the third thing is who can provide them with markets. Um, And uh, Europeans, Euro-Americans are are looking for those three things. And they're pretty willing to go with any government that can actually secure them for them. Mm -hmm. Um, So... And that that's that was the I found the most fascinating. Like I, I like the shaker stack section. Okay, I, I really enjoyed <laughs> that part, but I also found it very fascinating how you kind of were like, like, well, let me take a step back there. I, like I never like when you read about the Constitutional Convention, you read you think about like the compromises about slavery, big states, small states, and like all this politics, but I never thought about the Mississippi River being a part of this conversation and you kind of highlight that that is actually also something that contributes to like what do we need to do for the country to kind of survive long term and um i kind of going to show my ignorance it almost sounded like you were the first one saying that but i'm hoping that's not the case um not quite uh <laughs> No, um, other people talk about it too, but actually it's interesting because a lot of, um, a lot of the debates that matter in the 19th century, you know, like over things like slavery, um, Mm -hmm. are not necessarily the debates that spurn, you know, that spawned the writing of the constitution, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, in our historiography, because, because, you know, uh, certain things become what matters a lot later on we tend to think that a lot of thought must have gone into them at the, the moment of creation. But, and, you know, in, in actuality, um, a lot of the issues that, you know, like the, the constitutional crisis in the United States that emerges in the 19th century, that is the civil war um, is over a whole different set of issues mm-hmm. than their thinking might cause a, you know, a crisis of union in the 18th century. Um, so in the 18th century, the biggest division um, isn't a north-south division, uh, but it's really an east-west division. Mm-hmm. Um, and eastern states at the end of the American Revolution are really, um, they're searching for markets. They're desperate to find somebody who's willing to trade with them. Mm-hmm. Um, Britain is flooding the American market with British trade goods, but they're not allowing American ships to trade within the British Empire. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, like Cape Cod, which had, you know, previously made most of its money selling salt fish to um, to the sugar producing islands of the Caribbean is suddenly trying to find a market for its fish and they can't sell it to Jamaica anymore. Um, the only company, the only place that's really willing to trade with them at all is France. And France is also very unwilling to give Americans access to its um, new world markets. Hmm. So um, they're searching and searching and searching for a trade partner. And Spain starts to look really attractive. Um, Spain imports a lot of its food. um, And Spain is generally able to pay for what it imports uh, with gold and silver due to its huge colonial enterprises. So merchants in New York and in Philadelphia and in Boston um, are all desperate to establish a treaty with Spain that will allow them to access Spanish ports. Um, Meanwhile, you know, people in the West and to a large extent there, the people in the South, um, they tend to have closer connections to one another. Like for instance, Kentucky is part of Virginia. Tennessee is part of North Carolina. Um, So those regions tend to align more with the South, excuse me, with the West. Um, And so for the West, the most important issue is gaining access to the Mississippi River and with it being able to export goods into the Caribbean mm-hmm. and the Atlantic world. Um, and so that crisis is when Spain closes the river in 1784, um, pretty much most of the country, um, most of the political elite in the country are pretty mad. They're very angry. Um, mm-hmm. They they know that closing the river means that Western expansion is going to be slowed, that the value of Western land is going to fall. Um, so they're all pretty upset. Uh, but in 1786, when, um, the United States is finally about to sort of negotiate a treaty with Spain, um, the negotiators have to decide, do we focus on real reopening trade with, you know, with Spain, or do we focus on reopening the Mississippi? 
um, and which one is more valuable to the United States right now. Um, and ultimately, Congress decides to go with reopening trade um, and at the sacrifice, essentially, of the Mississippi and of claims to the Mississippi. And the reaction within Congress is immediate and furious. So, um, yeah, it sees that, right? It's like it's a horse trade of like, oh, you sold us out to get the other saying, and we're really upset about that. Absolutely. And you've got, you know, um, like James Monroe is writing these infuriated letters back to to uh, you know, to James Madison back in Virginia, to Patrick Henry back in Virginia, mm -hmm. being like, "You won't believe what they did." And essentially, um, you know, it it makes the West okay. and the South certainly feel like they're not really fully part of mm -hmm. the. There are more northern states, um, and in this time period, actually, they don't call them northern states; they call them eastern states, essentially. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so, those eastern states are um, certainly acting in their own interests. But the question really becomes very, very early: um, what is the national interest? Mm -hmm. You know, is it to have the river open? Is it to have trade with Spain? What is most, what is best for the nation? And that raises a lot of questions about what is the nation, essentially. And under the Articles of Confederation, nobody has any good answers. So, well, even under the Constitution, that's somewhat challenging. But, and, and it's it's the situation, right? You're a young country and you have these great powers that don't really consider you quite part of them. So it's like, it, it is challenging. How do you bargain? What do you have to offer? And like, like, we want everything, but we have very little yet to return in in that. So it's it's a hard a hard situation, and it's it's fascinating when you were talking that like that east west north south and even like that triumvirate west north south sort of like there there are still conversations sometimes that appear during the Civil War like antebellum so aware of like oh maybe maybe by cutting the mississippi off from the west it will hamper their trade and they will join forces with the south of course with railroads that's not really an option anymore but it's it, it it's interesting how long lived some of these these concepts that you're talking about are in in the country at, at large if you want <clears throat> absolutely i mean you know um Abraham Lincoln, of course, famously, you know, traveled down the Mississippi a few times. Um, Not to kill vampires. <laughs> <laughs> My wife unpacks a vampire slayer book again. Oh, know. good times. Oh, no, I, I haven't read that one. Um, I watched the I like watched the first hour of the movie on a flight one time. <laughs> I got asked in the library when I checked out Lincoln books. I was like, "Do you think you want?" No, no, we're not even <laughs> going to talk about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That craziness. Um, uh, so that 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 is an interesting concept because you do also have sort of like the question about separation in in your book. And usually we kind of think, I, I think the first time we really start thinking about it is sort of with the War of 1812, right? New England saying, no, we don't really like what these Westerners and Southerners got us into, and we we might need to consider leaving the United States. But you you hear over this trade question have actually people in the West debating like, hmm, maybe we should create something of our own or join forces with the Spanish to kind of get access to this trade. Like, is this like, I don't want to say like, are they that unloyal to the United States, but are they just that that's trade centered that they're willing to go with whoever offers them the best trade deal? Well, I do think, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, it is a matter, I think in many ways of loyalty, but I don't think that they actually like at this point, it loyal to what, right. Um, well, yeah. That's a you good know, point. if we're talking about 1786, uh, really between 1786, well, 1784 and, um, 1789 like mm -hmm. there really is not much of a united states yeah. uh like the the federal government isn't really a thing it's not really mm -hmm. doing much you know there um i didn't realize until i was you know researching this book exactly how broke the u.s government was mm 
I mean, at one point they're borrowing $16. Like they, $16, they, they don't have $16 like in cash to see Like, so they are, um, you know, and for months and months and months at a time, Congress never meets. Um, and it doesn't meet because there aren't enough representatives there to actually form a quorum. So like whenever there is a quorum present, they do these bursts, these giant bursts of energy and like get a bunch of stuff done. But you can read like page after page of the congressional record. And it's like, you know, didn't meet not enough people, essentially. Um, so, you know, if you're um, a Euro-American person living in Kentucky uh, wow. in that time period, um, you know, there's... Wow no real federal government it's not really doing much or anything essentially um and so i think you know the during that time period too um like you know if i asked you who was president of the united states in 1787 um you know they would know yeah, yeah well i mean what would it mean i guess president yeah. of congress at that point but yeah. um you know the congress is hampered by all these restrictions um yeah. and by um the refusal of many of the states to cooperate with one another mm -hmm. um and so you end up with like they're they really are um you know sitting out there like being they're not it's not really a question so so much for them of whether they should even be loyal like i think okay. uh it would matter more to be loyal to virginia for instance than it would mm. to be loyal yeah. to the united states essentially yeah um so yeah but at the same time they're willing to kind of join hands with an imperial rival to kind of get that trade access right they know. are and at different times you know um uh, certain individuals are are floating idea the big one being james wilkinson yeah i love um, that guy <laughs> yes yeah. he deserves his own hbo miniseries <laughs> um, <laughs> is that the same like um wasn't there a Wilkinson too that dealt with like Jefferson, like got really mad at him? Yeah. So, uh, James Wilkinson, um, general James Wilkinson is a fascinating guy. Uh, he, during the American civil revolution, he was court-martialed twice, um, for his behavior. Um, he tried to, like, he basically was part of a cabal to get, um, George Washington demoted essentially. And, um that didn't that didn't work obviously um also not in hamilton <laughs> right exactly um <laughs> but then later on when aaron burr is um you know trying in 1807 mm -hmm. when aaron burr goes to the west and is talking about trying to create a separate republic in the west it's james wilkinson he goes to huh. um but at the same but time for him, too, it never died like he, oh, he always yeah. had that kind of conspiracy idea in him well i think wilkinson um i mean there's a there's a book by Andrew Linklater called An Artist in Treason and it's about James Wilkinson and I think it's a great title and it's it's really yeah. very very true about who James Wilkinson was. Um I think James Wilkinson in particular is like one of those you know in the modern era would be diagnosed with some sort of a um you know a like uh, his his grasp on reality seems a little tenuous actually okay. he tends to really believe what he's saying um so he would fit in really well with the republican party today um not gonna weigh in on that um but um i can't as an outsider from another like, continent he is absolutely Crazy. Um, like fully he fully commits to everything that he's he's saying essentially so but at the same time too right that the james wilkinson um so wilkinson it goes down to spanish new orleans and he offers to spain he says hey spanish officials you know um i am really important in kentucky i can go back yeah. to kentucky and i'm going to convince my neighbors that we should separate from the united states and become part of spain um and that's what he says initially. And uh, the Spanish officials had actually been looking for somebody back in Kentucky who could help them cultivate a relationship with Kentucky, mm. possibly separate the region from the rest of the United States. Um, mm. And so they've seen Wilkinson. They're like, hey, this guy's perfect. Let's let's hire him. Let's 
So they start paying James Wilkinson, um, and he is becomes an agent of Spain, essentially, uh, and receives an annual pension from Spain for several years. Um, but, you know, while he's still in the pay of Spain, Andrew, uh, excuse me, um, Wilkinson rejoins the U.S. Army and becomes so like the highest ranking agent. officer in the U.S. Army while also being a agent of Spain. Um, you know, and he continues this relationship for a really long time. When he ultimately dies, he dies in Mexico. And that's not, you know, a, uh, you know, he and Aaron Burr, between the two of them, you could have a really fun time uh, <laughs> rethinking American history, um, essentially. Yeah, when has that been something? <laughs> oh my yeah, God. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's an interesting, like, you, they found somebody that was willing to deliver or at least like say what they wanted to hear and like crazy Absolutely. enough to commit. Like. Well, and I think honestly, um, I think honestly, if Spain had not been Catholic, then the Ooh. chances of uh, Westerners actually joining the Spanish Empire would have been um, mm. much, much higher. I think the the fact that it was a monarchy that bothered them, they would prefer uh, a republic. But um, the fact that it was Catholic, I think actually probably was the biggest barrier mm-hmm. to them actually deciding to like unite with Spain. And so pretty quickly, Wilkinson drops the idea of Kentucky becoming a uh, like actual colony of Spain, oh. um, but instead maybe an independent entity that will ally with Spain. Mm. Um, essentially that look a little more feasible essentially but ultimately um, you know the what changes things and what makes the west stop uh, considering like seceding really um, is a few different things one the writing of the constitution Mm. means that the United States government actually sends federal troops to the West. Um, And that makes a big difference. Uh, And then another big thing that happens is that once George Washington takes office, he gives political power to many of the people who are already have sort of social power in the region. Mm -hmm. And so figures who otherwise, you know, um, like suddenly figures who had previously been thinking about not being united with the United States have much more of a buy-in with right. the United States. Um, so like sort of he, co-opting the leadership. Yeah. He buys some. Yeah, exactly. They give you an office and you don't right. pursue well, I mean, any like, other ambitions. I don't know what George Washington, I mean, George Washington is like sitting in, you know, New York being like, well, we need a postmaster in, you know, in right. Danville, Kentucky, who do you know? Like, yeah. Uh, so, um, so a lot of people end up in positions of, of greater authority, um, you know, and that's part of what leads to um, the West not seceding. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> that's uh, it is that that sort of challenging aspect there. And um, what I was thinking about here, how about so the um, we do eventually have the treaty with Spain and the United States gets the ability to trade through New Orleans, even though it's not, it's not part of the United States. Does that like kind of first thing here, does that ease some of the concerns among Westerners that they kind of are like, Ooh, maybe, maybe we, we can figure out a way to get through that Spanish part and then trade with the rest of the world. Yeah. So um, in 1796, essentially, um, it's debated in 1795, it goes into action in 1796, but late in the year. And given the realities of trade, it's really 1797 before a Pinckney's Treaty starts to sort of operate um, in the West. And so Pinckney's Treaty uh, is finally that treaty with Spain that everybody had been waiting for. Um, And it sets up two big things. Um, it sets up, um, it expands the boundaries of the United States. 
Uh, and the United States is now going to stretch down to what's now sort of the, the northern border of Florida, now mm -hmm. modern day Florida, essentially. Um, Spain is withdrawing its claims to that region, uh, sort of between modern day Florida and sort of southern Tennessee, essentially. So Mississippi and Alabama, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and Spain... Uh, is withdraws its claim and also as you said it gives americans the right to transship their goods through new orleans so americans are going to be able to bring goods to new orleans and have american ships come and take them out um but um and while this it does create a big change it's it's hugely celebrated and um amongst euro americans in the west you know the people in kentucky are, you know, throw giant parades Ooh, it's a party um, yeah, they're thrilled. Um, it does, it's definitely, um, it becomes clear fairly quickly that this idea of transshipment is problematic uh, for sure. Um, the The biggest issues, so with the transshipment, it, it means that if an American good arrives in New Orleans and an American ship comes and exports it, then there's no taxes that need to be paid. Okay. But if an American brings a good to New Orleans and then sells it to somebody who lives in New Orleans, then taxes do need to be paid on that same good. Right. Now it's an That's import. Now okay. it's an import. Yeah. And if that that second person subsequently exports it. Um, now it's an export. Then, now it's an export and it needs to pay a new tax, essentially. Oh, so um, you create a really, uh, well, an opportunity, essentially, for everybody to cheat. <laughs> um, you know, like, like the smuggling opportunities here are pretty gigantic. Um, but it also, I mean, the reality of it is, uh, once more, if we go back to geography, um, we, you know, again, if you look at Pinckney's treaty and you see, oh, Americans can trade through New Orleans, you think, oh, great, like this solves the problem. But if you think about what the landscape of New Orleans and the region actually is the the situation changes a lot so once a ship arrives at um like the mouth of the mississippi river um it's about a month-long journey um you know four to six weeks to get from the like the atlantic ocean i mean the gulf of mexico up to new orleans mm -hmm. like and what's crazy about that on our maps it looks like just like you know like a fingernail worth of distance maybe it's a long but drive. We tried it once. <laughs> right. It's a long drive and it's really windy and twisty mm -hmm. and you're going against the current of the Mississippi River, which right. is obviously huge. Yeah. Um, and you're still sail powered. You're not steam powered. Right. Too. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult. And there's all kinds of sandbars across the, right. the whole thing and all these like trees just like headed out to the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. down the Mississippi. Um, you know, so it's pretty dangerous. Yeah. Um, so what happens is like so if you're a ship and you're arriving in new orleans um when american ships arrive they have a problem because if they want to bring american goods to the port and then they want to participate in this transshipment they need to sell it to americans mm. um, so they arrive in the atlantic ocean they arrive in new orleans and uh like your ship is full of i don't know chairs and like hammers, whatever your your right. fabric. Actually, honestly, it's the 18th century. It's mostly fabric. Um, when you arrive, you're trying to figure out. Um, you know, you want to sell what you brought, but if you're gonna export it back up to where there are American people actually living, yeah, even you know Natchez, but Kentucky, Tennessee, where most mm -hmm. of the Euro American population is centered. Um, you've got to load up one of those boats we talked about before right. and have people pull it up the river. Right. So what that means essentially is that ships arriving from the Atlantic Ocean can't come with any cargo to sell. Yeah. Um, if they, there's nothing that no one wants to carry that up. <laughs> river, right. Nobody know. wants to carry it up. There's no, I mean, there's really no point. You could get stuff from Pittsburgh cheaper than shipping it yeah. up river from, uh, yeah, from New Orleans. Yeah. So, um, so it's a one-way market, really. It's really very much a one-way market. So what the Americans do is they sell their ships to Spanish people. Um, like they come fully loaded, they arrive in port, and they find a Spanish merchant uh, or somebody with Spanish citizenship, more accurately. So it's it's typically uh, somebody from the United States 
um, right, yes. from England, but who's willing to buy their ship. And they sort of like shadow sell the ship, um, like mm. the, the person who will buy it for a dollar. And now it's a Spanish ship. Right. So whatever imports it brought can now be sold as the like as the as something belonging to a Spanish person, okay. and it, therefore it's going to pay much smaller taxes than if it had cool. arrived um, owned by an American. But then, now the ship is Spanish, and mm -hmm. that means that when the 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 flour, flour and whiskey and bacon arrive from Kentucky and Tennessee and increasingly Ohio. Um, they can't be loaded onto that ship because now it's a Spanish ship, right? So it right. can't participate right. in this transshipment trade. So now you have uh, to sell the ship back. So they have to sell the ship back, but you can't necessarily do that in uh, a Spanish port. Um, like it's for the ship to become Spanish is one thing for it to become American while it's in the port is a, is a different thing. So um, you ultimately end up with uh, everybody kind of lying most of the time. Um, and the Spanish officials sitting there being like, I, what do we do? Um, you know, and so they very pragmatically, they come to a, an arrangement with American merchants in the city and they are like, all right, we're just going to tax everything at like 7%. Um, you know, it doesn't matter who's, who, who's doing our buying and selling. It's just going to be 7%, whatever. Um, and when they send that back to like Spain, Spain's like, um, no, like you can't do that. It's. Spanish right. shipping is, is treated this way and American shipping is treated this way. And it gets back to New Orleans. They're like, yeah, we're not going to do that. Like, yeah. I, we just can't. Yeah, that's like the metropolis bureaucrats who sing in one reality and don't know what the reality on the ground is, right? Absolutely. That's... Especially because Spain is not sending ships to New Orleans. Well, no. <laughs> you know, Spain is not sending ships full of fabric and stuff right. for the port. So yeah. they're like, well, if we're going to have anything from, mm -hmm. you know, Atlantic world markets, we need to get it from American shippers yeah. who are actually showing up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so New Orleans becomes a place where everybody is violating international law kind of constantly. Um, but that creates a really big problem because at the same time too, you know, all this is unfolding against the backdrop of the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. um, and the Napoleonic Wars one com key component of it is the sea battle, um, which is primarily fought between you know both the Spanish, the French, and the British navies, uh, but also privateers. Right. And so, um, any ship leaving the port of New Orleans, uh, you know, if you're a British privateer and you're looking at it, if it's a Spanish ship, then it's you can board it, you can you know take its cargo. Uh, if it's an American ship, it's supposed to be neutral, but how are you supposed to know? Right. Like, you know, I, I the, very few people would know which which nation a certain ship belonged to. Right. So, right. No, it's well, it sort of reminds me of like one of my first when I went to the podcast, one of the first people I interviewed was uh, Karen Bell, was their or Creole New Orleans book. Mm -hmm. And it's like e exactly that time period that she's looking at too, of like all these individuals from Haiti through Jamaica or Cuba coming by smuggling with pirates into the is a new New Orleans region and like this like it 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 is this like like everyone is coming and like no one really knows what's happening <laughs> that's just yeah I God I feel sorry for the Spanish officials in in town yeah they're um they're in a really challenging situation. I mean, there are almost no Spanish people in the region. Yeah, it's all French. So you no, know, it's 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 many French people. It's many newly arrived Euro Americans. It's yeah. uh, people who fled the American Revolution. Um, you know, indigenous peoples. And here's Spain trying to manage all of this. And um, you know, they're uh, they really can't. I mean, it, it's not really a situation. It's a situation where you know, um, there's no incentive really for mm -hmm. anybody to actually follow the law. <laughs> so, you know, nobody's going to essentially. Well, it's like we always forget sort of too, right? It's like, it's not just that their support of New Orleans, but it's also all of Louisiana that Spain now has too. Like, 
there's the entire Missouri drainage that they have to deal with now. And, and well, theoretically, but they're not really. I mean, well, yeah, not of so course, much. right? Like you have they to pick could. your battles. Yeah. Um, well, and I think too, one of the interesting things that happens um, with in New Orleans, though, and why, um, you know, in many ways, a situation where everybody's cheating kind of works to everybody's advantage, sort of. That's true. Yeah. To some extent. But what ends up happening is there are these moments where, for some reason, uh, the Spanish government cracks down mm. on, you know, an individual and everyone ship. Everyone gets upset. Right. Or on an individual, like, uh, who's importing goods from downriver, like, from Kentucky or Tennessee oh, and is arriving in New Orleans, and everybody gets mad. Yeah. Um, and it's those moments where, you know, one person ends up with their entire cargo confiscated, um, you know where Spain is asserting its control over the river because it, it does have some actually pretty significant control over the port of New Orleans, right. um, over access to it, at least. Um, not so much trade within it, but access to it, yes. Um, and so when Spain asserts that, that really, really bothers uh, Americans. Um, oh, imagine that. Trade. And the whole thing ramps up and anger and frustration gets sort of put on, on steroids when um, cotton really comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in 1796, the United States acquires um, Natchez, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1795, the same year that Pinckney Street is actually signed initially, that's the same year that Natchez first plants any cotton. Right. And now it booms. And, and it explodes you know they're by they go from planting like ten thousand pounds of cotton in 1795 to planting uh you know four million pounds of cotton in 1800 so it's a i mean it's it's a mind-boggling shift in trade right. um that's occurring at this time period and yeah. cotton really heightens everybody's uh sort of worries over the mm -hmm. who's going to control the mississippi because cotton um, occupies a really unique place within global markets, right? So, um, you know, England can grow its own grain, but it cannot produce its own cotton. No. So you've got uh, like what seems often to be like a nearly insatiable British market for cotton um, and a real opportunity for American merchants who for since the American Revolution have really really struggled to figure out how do you balance mm -hmm. American trade, like American imports of British goods yeah. with what do you offer in return? Right? right. What do you offer in return? And here's this crop yeah. cotton that offers the possibility of actually, you know, offsetting that. Yeah. And so um, the, like the addition of cotton to this whole story, you know, yeah. that I started off with about land uh, really just shifts cool. the, the goalpost essentially right. you know um and people who really couldn't care less about whether kentucky becomes part of the union you know like if if ohio separated they would not be upset um you know when it's when we're talking about cotton and we're talking about natchez they're like oh no we have to get this cotton to market yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you end up with um a much much more interested eastern seaboard um mm -hmm once that becomes part of the picture essentially. well the value also increases right of like if you absolutely like, here's some pelts or here's some barrels of whiskey or some backs of flour coming down the mississippi they don't bring the money that billion uh, millions of bales of cotton bring <laughs> so it's 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 a whole new new conversation all of a sudden um but I'm glad you bring up Natchez because I, I also wanted to briefly at least touch on the, what do you call the Chickasaw Natchez trays? And like, it it seemed like, I mean, it, that's the one thing everyone sings of, right? Like, of course, it's a national park and like, it's still there mm -hmm. and you can drive it. And, but it's, it seemed like a very short-lived thing because once, like, once steam power comes about, it sort of falls, like, falls to the side it's not that important anymore yeah um so actually uh sorry sorry child care emergency 
Um, uh oh. We're almost done. Promise. Promise. Okay. Um, uh, we're the kids are already back in school here, so. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um. So the Natchez Trace. Uh, or the Chickasaw Trace, or the Nashville Road, or the Natchez Road. It all depends on who you're talking, you're talking to, about, yeah. what direction people are going. Um, but essentially, uh, it's a road. Um, mm -hmm. And it's actually, that is glorifying it. Um, I was going to ask, what do, what do I have to imagine now when you say road? It's a path, okay. essentially. And it's Grass, sort of... Grass, mud, dirt... Yeah, so basically, and it's not even that, even um, at different times. So for, for centuries, there's been this sort of trade route oh. that connected the Natchez people with uh, the Chikaza people, for instance, the, the ancestors of the, the Chickasaw people, mm -hmm. um, that had connected them. And it's this road that runs along sort of a little bit of a high ground, essentially, okay. between two waterways so mm -hmm. water on one side of it is sort of flows into the tom bigby river um right. and then down into the the mobile river mm -hmm. ultimately essentially and it'll end up over there uh on one side and on the other side water that gets into it is going to flow downwards into the mississippi essentially so you know you're either going to new orleans or you're going to to mobile <laughs> essentially if you're a drop of water but if you're a person um what that creates is a place that isn't as swampy as many other places are oh. in in uh this region of the world um so it's uh it had been a like a deer path it had been a trading path mm. um but it became um once your americans have access to new orleans um it becomes a, a whole different thing so um once American merchants or farmers really from Kentucky, Tennessee, and Ohio have access to New Orleans every year. Uh, you know, the country store in Lexington, Kentucky, for instance, is going to load up all of the produce that it produced that year. They're going to hire a bunch of local boys who are super mm -hmm. excited to leave town because they've never been anywhere with more than like 3000 people. Um, or not even like 400 yeah. people. Yeah. Uh, you know, young Abraham Lincoln is, is one of these guys. Um, and they come down the Ohio River on a, on a boat loaded with this produce. And then they go, they keep floating down the Mississippi to New Orleans. And once they arrive in New Orleans, um, they sell their goods to a person who is going to deal with international markets, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to load up with cash. They're going to get all the money that they had, that they've earned, essentially, this year. Um, like, so they're bringing back their family's income, essentially, for, for often several years, actually, um, worth of labor. And so they're getting it paid in cash, um, like in gold and silver coins sometimes, often in bills. Um, some of it is like uh, promissory notes, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, but they're getting paid in that and they're carry they have to then get that stuff back to their farms back in Kentucky, back in Ohio. So um, they've got to get home somehow. And we've already talked about how hard it is to go back up the Mississippi. Cool. So um, what they decide to do or what most people end up doing is walking. So um, long trip. <laughs> it's a really long trip. It's about um, 500 to 700 miles from Natchez to, to Nashville. Um, 700 is excessive it's not 700 it's like 550 mm -hmm. um you know it's a little tough to say with like the modern natchez trace goes over um like the the national park cool. goes over parts of the original but it's not quite it doesn't right. quite align with the actual mm -hmm. route um and so they have to walk back to uh nashville and then on to their homes in kentucky or ohio so even further than that uh, you know, Absolutely. 550 miles. You're two months um, walking. And so they're walking and they're walking with, uh, the thing about it is, is that it's seasonal. So mm. throughout most of the year, this path is, is used by indigenous peoples. It's used by like missionaries moving mm. south into mm. the region. Um, but once, but for several months of the year, it's pretty much entirely, these Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee farm boys walking back home with 
the money that their families have earned for the last several years, like strapped to their bodies, essentially, and saddlebags on their their horses. Like mm. you, you, hear, you see a lot of people like sewing it into their underwear, essentially. Yeah. But I was going to say, there's probably some sifts that will go on as well. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Some of them lose it and yeah, and uh, the road that they take is the Natchez Trace. Um, and they take the Natchez Trace for many reasons, but one of the biggest ones is that they're traveling through indigenous territory um, mm. to get from Natchez to uh, to Nashville. You, they needed to walk through uh, first Choctaw and then Chickasaw. Chickasaw. Oh my gosh! Okay, let's try that again. We're almost done. <laughs> first Choctaw and then Chickasaw territory. Yeah. Um, and so the. If they're on the trace, they are in a much more protected position hmm. than if they're not. Um, it sounds like the Chickasaw almost made like a business out of caring for travelers along the trace. And the Chickasaw do exactly that. Um, Chickasaw um, insist when the United States comes to them and say, hey, we want to build a road that goes through Chickasaw territory. The Chickasaw say, okay. You can build a road, but we're the only ones who are going to be allowed to build like inns or taverns mm. or stores uh, to supply the people going on this road. Um, and so what this does when the, you know, is that essentially the Chickasaw siphon off part of that cash mm -hmm. that's going back to Kentucky and Tennessee. Yeah. Um, and for most uh, mostly it's the chickasaw elite who are going to benefit from this hugely especially the, the the colbert family um who are uh going to establish ferries and um control again many choke points along the trail mm -hmm. essentially um they're going to profit from this hugely uh and so um, but overall one of the big things it does is it creates it gives the chickasaw a little bit of power in its negotiations mm -hmm. with the United States um, because this route is so important to Kentucky and Tennessee and Ohio mm -hmm. um, that if the Chickasaw shut it down and they don't even have to like completely shut it down, if they just make it dangerous enough, right. um, you know, that, that, that will be very disruptive essentially. Mm -hmm. right. um, it's in everybody's best interest to cooperate on this. You know, if the Chickasaw demands that you pay $6 to get across this ferry, then you pay. <laughs> You pay essentially, right? Um, so, um, hmm. the Chickasaw end up uh, like as a as a, a nation, um, sort of. They're going through a lot of changes at this time. They reorient politically, but but even the the presence of the Natchez Trace and the huge numbers of people moving along it uh, really lead the Chickasaw to reorient many aspects of their lives. And so, even their communities, like the locations of many of their communities, change. Mm. Um, to sort of service parts of the trace, essentially. Wow. Yeah. Um, it also means that so the very Chickasaw, disruptive. It's very disruptive, but at the same time, too, um, it can be kind of productive mm. for the Chickasaw. You know, they have access to cash that isn't from the federal government, mm -hmm. um, mm. which gives them the ability to um, invest mostly in like infrastructure things, mainly like cotton gins, for instance. Um, in a way that other indigenous nations, you know, don't in the same way, um, or where ownership is vested in Chickasaw hands as opposed to in uh, Euro American hands, and so it does mean that the Chickasaw um, become sort of a better capitalized essentially mm. than other groups. Yeah. Um, okay. And of course, that leads then to establishment of plantations and slavery and yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the hope of like looking as your your American as possible and that will allow them to stay. And well, that didn't quite work out. No, absolutely not. But it does mean to too. I mean, you know, the, the Chickasaw had a, a you know a terrible but distinctive experience with Western removal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it looks very different if you look at Chickasaw removal versus, say, Cherokee removal. Um, you know, they're very different stories. And mm -hmm. in part, you know, the the origins of those different trajectories lie in this difference in their relationship with the federal government that emerges mm 
in the 1790s, cool. 1800s, essentially. Yeah. But then I think the really interesting thing about the Chickasaw Trace always is that in white Euro-Americans who are moving north along the Chickasaw Trace are almost like a little bit of an asset to the Chickasaw mm-hmm. people. Like they can they can profit from yeah. them. Yeah. White Euro-Americans who are moving south along the Chickasaw Trace are a threat. Mm. Um, often they're threatening indigenous homelands. Like they're settlers, they're coming through to look for for land, um, you know. So southern southbound traffic is a very different mm. um, entity, yeah. and that becomes even more true though as the Natchez Trace quickly becomes one of the major routes for bringing enslaved people from the Upper South mm. into the the Deep South. Um, right. So the Forks of the Road Nat- market in Natchez, the second largest slave mar- market in the United States. Um, is at the forks of what road? It's at the forks of the the Natchez Trace. It's right at the end of it. And so, um, you know, this road that um, does become less, much less important to Euro-Americans moving cash upriver, that becomes much less important once the steam engine comes into play and people can take steamships back up the Mississippi if they want. Um, But the Natchez Trace is going to remain mm-hmm. a really right. prominent way in which enslaved people are brought to the South. Yeah. Um, so. Ooh, crazy. Yeah. Um, so final, no, it makes the final question since we're going okay. long at this point. Now, what, what I really kind of thought about, because you, you gave us a book, a really provocative title, I felt like, right? This, this empire of commerce. And I, I feel like it juxtaposes so nicely with sort of Jefferson's notion of this empire of liberty that he wants to create with the United States. And sort of like, how do you feel these two interacting with one another? Because I, I guess you can see like a conflict between sort of an empire of liberty and an empire of commerce, but they can also be very symbiotic in in, in their relationship. Absolutely. So for me, I think with the with the idea of empire of liberty, one of the big points behind it was essentially, um, or that often sort of we get caught up with, is the idea of like independent farm families will be producing for themselves. You know, um, I would argue that no one has ever really desired to be self sufficient. Um, you know, life is not great if you don't have access to sugar. And to rum, <laughs> and to you know, iron, um, and none of those things you're making for yourself, essentially, you know, in Ohio or, you know, Indiana, right? Um, so um, we have this idea of these like independent farm families that are going to be self sufficient, but reality is, um, self sufficiency is not desirable in the first mm-hmm. place, but also not really possible. One of the truest things about land in the American experience is. Um, the federal government or state governments almost always insist that land get paid for. Mm-hmm. Um, and land is going to have to be paid for somehow. And almost nobody has the cash in hand to buy land in advance, right? Like to, to like, you know, even today, right? If you wanted to buy land, you need a mortgage, right? You know, or three. Um, but, uh, but, uh, and so what they, they don't yet really have, uh, like purchasing mortgages. There's other kinds mm-hmm. of mortgages that exist at the time. You can use your land as collateral for sure, right. but they need to come up with ways where people can purchase land without having the capital up front to purchase mm-hmm. the land. But that insists that down the road, somehow they're going to have to get that capital and mm-hmm. trade is going to be how they're going to get it. And so always tied up in this idea of individual farm families having access to land is the idea that individual farm families need to have access to markets Mm -hmm. and that the market is really what's going to facilitate this process of allowing people to purchase land um, to live in other places. And also too, you know, Jefferson might've talked about small farmers, but he's a land speculator and everybody he knows is a land speculator. Right. And so, um, Mm -hmm. We imagine a tension between land speculators and small holders. Um, certainly that happens. But at the same time, too, sometimes they share their the same interests. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of those ways is getting access to markets. You know, if the large land speculators 
tenants or the people they want to sell to can't access a market, then, you know, when taxes come due, that large speculator is still going to lose access to the land. So um, for me, this empire of commerce idea is this is is really taking seriously this fact that land has to get paid for Mm -hmm. um, and that it is a commodity essentially. And so we have to take that into consideration. I mean, for me, the second thing too, um, was something that uh, sort of, in some ways I imagined myself as part of the new history of capitalism folks. And one of the things I think is happens a lot is that um, in a lot of those books, the West gets left out of the story. Um, mm-hmm. A lot of them focus on uh, like coastal cities, on mm-hmm. you know, things that happen in major ports, usually, um, essentially. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the nation at this time is well over 90% agricultural. So including agriculture in that story as much as possible, I think, is, is really important because, um, you know, it's still such a huge component of the economy. Uh, and I think land is really at the core of thinking about that, essentially. Yeah. So um, well, that's there where... There you go, the West matters. <laughs> Exactly. The West matters. Woo-hoo. Ah, that's a perfect scene to <laughs> that I've pursued in a very in various facets in interviews with authors. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, no, and uh, you're you're right, right? Like you, you can and it's not just the local markets that we're talking about. It is, as you say, the Atlantic markets and the kind of globalizing market spheres that is happening at this point. It's, it's not just like, oh, I'm selling in in Kentucky and to my local store, and I'm I'm thinking about selling to Spain. I'm thinking about selling to Britain, and it's mm-hmm. even though there's sort of this like uh, seeing like Bernard Balin having died so recently. It's like you know, it is the Atlantic world as much as he says, oh, it's coming to an end. For people at the time, it wasn't coming to an end. They didn't see that yet, and it is. It is that Atlantic commerce that you all want to be part of by this stage still. Absolutely. I mean, it's not going to take very long before like the, you know, a, a mill worker in Birmingham is yeah. eating American wheat and, yeah. you know, processing American cotton, yeah. you know, yeah. and much of that might have come from New Orleans, essentially. Exactly. So Exactly. <clears throat> All right. Well, we have talked for almost an hour and a half at this stage. And that is, as it is the week before the semester, you have a lot of things to prep with regard to syllabi, I assume. So, sadly, yes. I'm, I'm very glad you took as much time as you did out of your busy schedule today to, to talk to me and my audience about your new book. And um, for those interested and still with us listening um this was empire of commerce the closing of the mississippi river and the opening of atlantic trade university of virginia press if you're interested in getting the book um again thank you so much susan it was great to chat about your with you about the book um and um great i hope you have a great start into the new semester Thanks, you too. And with a new job, good luck. <laughs>